Therefore, it is time for a question period. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Premier. There's going to be a lot of talk over the next uh, few weeks on today's budget. And no matter what's in the budget uh, today, I want to remind everyone that in this budget, the people of Ontario will continue to pay the cost of the $1 billion gas plant scandal. True. And, the, and the billion dollar scandal just so happened, Speaker, to be because of lip. I, uh, I'm standing, and I suspect that uh, everyone wants to be here this afternoon, and if you choose, we'll do some warnings. And that's everyone. Thanks, because they can laugh all they want, but the billion-dollar scandal just so happened to be because the Liberals were afraid of losing a couple of seats. So you can just imagine the size of the scandal when this government's afraid of losing government. Speaker, what Liberal seat saver program will be in the budget, come to order. and how many billions of dollars will that future scandal cost Ontario taxpayers? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think it is safe to say that we have had this conversation many times in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, and I think that uh, the member opposite references today's budget, and it is a very important budget in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It's an important day. Our, uh, our upcoming budget this afternoon will continue to make investments in the lives of people in this province. It will be a balanced budget, Mr. Speaker, and from my perspective, the point the point of a balanced budget is to have a fiscal house that is in order that allows us to meet the needs of the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. We are living in very uncertain global times. It is government's responsibility to understand that, to put in place the support that people need so Answer. that the economy can keep growing. And I will reference that in my supplementary, Mr. Thank Speaker. You, and back to the Premier. No matter what shiny bauble, no matter what carrot on a string the Liberals will try to dangle in front of Ontarians, I want to remind everyone today that this budget, Ontario, of will still include a plan that forced Ontarians to overpay more than $9.2 billion for renewable contracts. $9.2 billion that could have went a long way to improve health care. $9.2 billion that could have helped with our schools. Remember for Beaches East York. That could have made life more affordable for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, why is it more important for this government to overpay $9.2 billion to liberal friendly firms than it is to invest that money in the people of Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that the, uh, the member opposite would characterize investment in education, investments in health care as shiny baubles, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I think that investments in education and health care are fundamental to the lives of the people in this province. I'm, uh, I'm loath to do this, but if we have to go to warnings, I will do that right away. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order. And if it continues, I will go to warnings. And if you miss the budget, that's your problem. Finish, please. So the work that we have done over the last number of years to, to invest in the people of the province, to invest in infrastructure and in people's retirement security, to work to make sure that everyone has access to education, what we see now, Mr. Speaker, is that we see a province whose uh, economic health is the top Answer. in the country. We're leading the country in economic growth, Mr. Speaker. We're leading the G7 company, countries. That's the work that we've done, and that's why we're Thank now you. in a position to invest in the people of Ontario. Yeah. And back to the Premier. Again, this Liberal government will want to hide from the facts. They're going to claim, Speaker, that this budget is some form of Liberal renaissance, but it's going to be the same old budget from the same old tired government, which cares more about their Liberal friends than the people on Main Street. And how do I know that, Speaker? Because this budget will still include a plan to sell off Hydro One, a plan that makes Liberal friends rich, but the average person more worse off. Mr. Speaker, why continue the fire sale of Hydro One in this budget? Why continue to make life harder under this Liberal government? So, Mr. Speaker, let me just let me just 
speak about um, the result of the, the impact of the decisions that we have made as a government, Mr. Speaker. So we've, um, we're making the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, $160 billion over 12 years. So that is, that is one example, Mr. Speaker. We've made this investment because we know it's good for the economy. So here are the results. Ontario's economy continues to outpace Canada all other G7 countries when it comes to economic growth, Mr. Speaker. In other words, we are leading in economic growth. Wow, this yeah. year's Moody's upgrade, Moody's upgraded Ontario's credit outlook, and the other major rating agencies affirmed Ontario's credit rating, Mr. Speaker. Our net debt to GDP has gone down to 38.3 percent. It's projected to continue a downward trend, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Exports are trending higher. Businesses are hiring. And household incomes are rising. Those are the indicators of the health of this economy, Mr. Speaker. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? New question? Member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks, Speaker. My, my question is back to the Premier. Over the last few years, the Liberals have spent quite a bit of money on their self promoting vanity ads. The right. ORPP, the David Suzuki ad, and just oh. lately, their hydro vanity ads. Classic. All of those, Speaker. All of those liberal self-promoting election ads were paid for by the taxpayers wow. of Ontario. Yep. So, Mr. Speaker, in today's budget, how many millions of dollars will the Liberals announce for their next set of good liberal re-election commercials? So, Mr. Speaker, um, today's, today's budget is about building on the foundation that we have laid, Mr. Speaker, the hard work that has been done by the people of Ontario over the last number of years, Mr. Speaker, work that has meant that our economic growth is leading the country, leading the G7 countries, Mr. Speaker. And what we now know is that it is time to invest. Now that we are bringing the budget to balance, as we said we would, Mr. Speaker, we are going to be able to invest in the people of this province. People are living with global uncertainty. It's really interesting to me that the opposition has come up with absolutely no plan, no initiatives, nothing that we can lead people in this province, Mr. Speaker. It's our responsibility as government to do that. That's what you'll see in the budget today. You see the please. Thank you. We're, we're now in warnings. Again, we're in warnings. Supplementary. Again, back to the Premier. The 2015 budget stripped the Auditor General of oversight. Yep. But a Liberal Premier, a former Liberal Premier, we all know, used to say it's never too late to do the right thing. Yep. And he was right. That's true. Mr. Speaker, will the Win Liberals do the right thing? Will the 2017 budget restore Auditor General oversight here, here. to government here, advertising? Here, here. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, um, let, me just say, let me just say to the member opposite, I agree, it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late for an opposition party to have a serious, thoughtful plan for the province and to engage in a debate Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? If this is a test of my resolve, I will pass it with flying colours. Final supplementary. To the Premier, I know, Speaker, there has to be somebody in the government benches that still has their integrity. Somebody has to be on the government benches that believes in ethics. Somebody over there has to believe in responsible government. Mr. Speaker, we need that person to stand up for what's right. We need them to tell the Premier she should not be campaigning on the taxpayer's dime. Liberal election ads are not government ads. They should not be paid for by the taxpayers of Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier turn around, face her caucus, and let's have that one Liberal member stand up and tell her to do what's right.
Mr. Speaker, I know that the member opposite knows that uh, we're the only government in the country that has uh, uh, laws about the uh, the uh, partisan nature of advertising and the non-partisan nature. Mr. Speaker, I know that the member opposite knows perfectly well that. The legislation that we put in place was in reaction to the extreme partisanship of, uh, of their party. So, Mr. Speaker, what I would say to this House and, and what I say to the people of the province, Mr. Speaker, is we have worked very hard to bring our budget to balance. You will see a balanced budget today, Mr. Speaker, and you will see investment in the people of this province at a time of global uncertainty when it is government's responsibility to make sure that we do everything we can to help people to thrive and to get ahead in their lives. That's what our budget will be about. You see it, please? You see it? New question, the member from Bramley Gore Moulton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier think that the drug coverage here in Ontario is adequate and sufficient to cover all the people of this province? Minister of yeah. Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's really great that the third party has uh, stepped up to the plate, yeah. joined the party, announced their commitment to universal pharmacare. Uh, because for the last three years, Mr. Speaker, this side of the legislature, we've been, with the Premier's leadership, we have been strongly advocating across this country, here in Ontario, across the country, with the federal government, my provincial and territorial partners, that this aspect of access to medicine is so critically important. So I'm elated. I mentioned it yesterday. I'm so happy that they have joined the efforts. We need all the help that we can get on this important issue of ensuring that every Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health acknowledges that our medical care system is incomplete for the past 50 years because of a lack of universal public pharmacare. The Premier and her government have had the Premier and her government have had 14 years to do something about it, have, do, have to do something to ensure that the people of Ontario have this coverage, but they don't seem to understand the urgent need. How can the Premier defend the status quo when 2.2 million Ontarians have no drug coverage whatsoever in this province? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, the third party has had 14 years to ask a question about pharmacare and, or ask a question about access to medications. And it's only Monday was the first time I've ever received a question with regards to access to medicines, Mr. Speaker. So, but again, I want to keep this. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, I've, I've, uh, I appreciate their advocacy, and I've, I've spoken many times about my own experience as a healthcare professional, uh, working with uh, patients and clients of a low uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, situations, where it's obvious that they do not possess the ability to fill the prescription that I might have given them for perhaps their child's uh, chest infection, yes, sir. perhaps a dermatological uh, skin rash or other problem. That's why it's important that all of us work together to ensure that that important Thank aspect you. of our health care system is fulfilled. Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, 2.2 million Ontarians have no drug coverage. One in four Ontarians can't afford to pay for life-saving medication, and the Minister of Health is talking about questions versus 14 years of being in power. That shows you the priority of this government. The Premier governs... The Premier governs like she's never had a job without a benefit before. The reality is, is that most of the jobs now that people get are jobs without benefits. People do not have drug coverage. And the fact is, people— Just to stop the clock. 
The member from Trinity Spadina is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, when people in this province get a prescription, they can't fill that prescription. They can't get the medication they need, and they can't get better. How can the Premier continue to defend the Liberal status quo? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I have to um, disagree in this, that there is the, we have made important improvements to the availability of medicines to Ontarians. Uh, last year alone, 170,000 more seniors who were paying a $100 annual deductible no longer pay that deductible. When they were paying a $6 copayment for each prescription, each drug, Mr. Speaker, that we reduced down to $2. Where we're providing hepatitis C drugs to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year for what has become almost a in 95 per cent of patients, a cure for a disease which has devastating consequences for those who do possess that infection, Mr. Speaker. We have more than 4,000 drugs that are available through our formulary that we're making available and we're increasing our ability, That's partly right. because of the work we're doing at the national level with the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Agency, Mr. Speaker. New question. Member from Bramley, Gormalton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question is to the Premier. Two weeks ago, this government tried to bury their own scathing critique of Ontario's unfair auto insurance system. The report said that Ontario has one of the lowest levels of automobile accidents and fatalities, yet the most expensive premiums for auto insurance in the country. Ontarians pay 55 per cent more than other Canadians when it comes to auto insurance. That means that $4 billion a year could have remained in the pockets of Ontarians if this government had taken their job seriously. We need action now, not more empty Liberal promises. What is it, when, is this going, when is this government going to take real action in order to bring down those premiums to inject some fairness into this system? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Well, you know, um, we have taken a number of actions, Mr. Speaker. We've required insurers to offer discounts for the use of winter tires. We've created a new dispute resolution system to help Ontario claimants get faster access to the benefits that they need. We've prohibited premium increases on uh, minor at-fault accidents. We've lowered the maximum interest rate charged on pr uh, monthly premium payments. And, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there's more to be done. That's exactly why we asked David Marshall to uh, give us an opinion on the auto insurance system in the uh, province. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be conducting consultations to determine the next steps. But we appreciate the recommendations that uh, that he has given us, and we recognize that there is more to be done. Even though, on average, auto insurance rates have come down, they haven't come down far enough, and we need uh, we need to take further action. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's so clear to people of this province that the Liberal government, that, that this Premier, do not understand the realities that people are facing. They just don't get it. They don't understand how the system is failing Ontarians. Their own report says it very clearly, and I quote, no one in the system is actively managing medical, medical care for accident victims. There are clear indications that accident victims are not receiving appropriate care. They are taking longer to recover, and many report that they've developed permanent impairments for simple soft tissue injuries." End quote. This is because they're not receiving the care in an adequate way. This government is failing the people of Ontario. When will this government take real action to ensure that the people of this province get the care they need, get the protection that they need? Thank you. President of the Treasury Board. President yes. of the Treasury Board. Thank you very, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we understand that in some cases there are catastrophic impairments, and in fact, we have uh, we have taken steps to address that. So, for example, Speaker, we amended the regulations to update the catastrophic impairment definition to be consistent with more up-to-date medical information and knowledge. In fact, we've got it now so that 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 uh, that definition is updated so that it. It is uh, consistent with the American Medical Association's guidelines, which means that Ontarians are protected while also making insurance more affordable. So we've got that consistency now with other North American systems. Um, the KPMG and, uh, in their annual report found Sir. that recent initiatives like that 2015 Ontario budget reforms actually are contributing to decreasing costs downward. 
Brethers. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, let's provide a translation of this Liberal language. They said they've updated the system. What that means is they've made it harder to get covered, to get harder to get defined as catastrophically injured. That means that less people are getting care, not more. In fact, if you look at what this government has done over the past seven years, Every change brought in by this government has systematically stripped Ontarians of benefits and put money directly in the pockets of the insurance industry. Shame. That's what this government has done. Shameful. Every change has stripped people of benefits. And most recently, speaking of the catastrophically injured, this government has taken the people who are the most vulnerable in this, in this society, the people who are the most seriously injured, and stripped them of half of their coverage. Half of their coverage has been stripped by this government. That means the people who are the most seriously injured will not see enough care to last their life. Question. That is a legacy of this Liberal government. They have systematically made this, this system more unfair. They've cut the Thank coverage. You. They've continued to benefit. Thank you. President. Yes, thank you very much. And you know, we we committed to reducing auto insurance costs, and uh, we know there's more work to do. But you do need to recognize that since 2013, uh, the rates have gone down about 8.5 percent on average. So we have had an impact. But it continues to be the case that while we've been making those reforms, that Ontario continues to have the most generous accident benefits in Canada. So we are we have been reducing costs, but we actually have been reducing costs in such a way that we do continue to have accident benefits that compare very favorably to other systems in Canada. Because we understand that there are two issues here. Answer. We need we need to control costs, but we also may need to make sure Ontario uh, Ontario citizens thank receive you. fair benefits. Question the member from Perth, Wellington. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. On a day of phony balanced budgets and skyrocketing debt, here's another shocking example of bad management by this government. It came to light recently that the Ministry of Natural Resources has failed to collect $3.5 million in unpaid fishing and hunting fines. Speaker, two-thirds of the MNR's budget is derived from the sale of fishing and hunting licenses, along with revenue from fines. And now the ministry is, is cutting funds to vital programs like aerial surveys of moose populations. Their excuse? A lack of funds. When will this minister stop sitting on her hands and collect these $3.5 million in unpaid fines? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and to uh, thank you for the member for this uh, for this question. Certainly, convictions and fines are strong deterrents. They remind the public of the importance of protecting our natural environment. Breaking ministry rules is a very serious offence and something I take very seriously. And I fully expect everyone to pay their fines. Fines from natural resources related convictions are set and collected by the courts and the municipalities where the offence occurred. And certainly these fines go back 20 years, Speaker. There's very many of them that uh, have been. Uh, um, the offenders have uh, gone back to their area in the United States, and there are some people that are not able to, to pay those fines from 20 years ago. So we do, in this, uh, on this side of the House, we expect people to, f to pay their fines and make sure that our sector is well looked after. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, but that answer just won't cut it. You know, people expect you to do your job and collect these fines, and you're not doing it. MNR officials work hard, Speaker, to enforce Ontario's conservation laws and make sure wildlife is protected. Yet, for all their efforts, the minister has left three and a half million dollars in fines just sitting on the table. In fact, Speaker, when the CBC tried contacting her office about it, the minister refused to say anything. Experts in wildlife management and conservation are growing concerned. Here's a quote from Julie Bone, who works for the nonprofit organization Ontario Nature, and I quote, It makes me worried about whether the ministry is taking compliance seriously, end of quote. So let me ask the question, Speaker. Does the minister take compliance seriously, yes or no? Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, you know, in the 90s, when the MNRF budget was gutted by the member opposite, and they didn't 
support the increases that we've had since then. I take that as a very rich thing. As a matter of fact, we are going to make sure that the municipalities have what they need. The member from Renfrew is warned. The member from Bruce, Huron Bruce, is warned. Finish, please. Thank you. And under the new contract, uh, under Bill 27, that gives more municipalities the ability to collect unpaid fines, we will be fully supporting that. But let me tell you that the the uh, member opposite have no plan for national resources. They have been silent on this. The third party. The member from Dufford Caledon is warned. Wrap up sentence, please. So the members opposite have no plan for natural resources in this province. On this side of the House, we certainly do. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The government seems to be happy to pay outrageous salaries to top hydro executives. In 2016, the chief financial officer of Hydro One accepted $700,000 in long-term incentives on top of his pay of $900,000. Now he's just quit after 22 months. Doesn't seem very long-term to me. <laughs> Why is Hydro One offering huge long-term sorry, huge long-term incentives to executives who seem very interested in raking in the cash on the short term and just moving on? Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, the uh, um, Hydro One has announced that its CFO will be moving uh, from the uh, company in May. Uh, Michael Vells has done an. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Michael Vells has done an excellent job with the company, contributing significantly to its transition, Mr. Speaker, to a better-run company. He's recently accepted a new position at another organization and will be leaving Hydro One next, one, next month, uh, Mr. Speaker. A search is already underway for a replacement. Um, but let's talk about Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. They are a better-run company. The new management at Hydro One has done an excellent job Answer. of improving the company, and it seems like every day there's new evidence. Uh, of just how customer focused Hydro One has become. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. The sell off of Hydro One by the Liberals has meant a company focused on investors and executives, all while asking for a 20% increase in rates. The salaries at the top reflect that focus, making a group of executives very rich, while Ontario families have to deal with the fallout. The Premier has chosen to borrow her way out of the problem we're seeing with higher hydro rates, incurring a liability to Ontario of an amount to exceed more than $40 billion. She needs to admit that the sale of Hydro One has been a winner for executives and bad news for Ontario families. Will she stop the sale of Hydro One? Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. This good news story, Mr. Speaker, is on track to raise $9 billion, $4 billion for infrastructure for this province, Mr. Speaker. It's improved company performance and customer service. Once again, improved customer service is good news mm -hmm. for customers, unlike what they have on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, which is no news for customers, Mr. Speaker. You know what? The opposition doesn't support our infrastructure investments. We get that. $13.5 billion in the GTHA uh, GO Regional Express Rail, $5.3 billion in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, wow. tripling the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, something that they are against, Mr. Speaker. $1.73 million, or $173 million, Mr. Speaker, for Highway 69 Answer. expansion. These are things that this government is doing for this province, things that they vote against, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question, the member from Kingston and the Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. I have heard from individuals, advocates, and stakeholders in my community that there was a need to re- 
redesign the medical reviews process to better serve Ontario disability support recipients. They told us that too many medical reviews were being done unnecessarily for clients whose condition was unlikely to change. Mr. Speaker, this not only created undue stress for Ontario disability support recipients, but it also it resulted in increased workloads for medical professionals, legal aid clinic, and others. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, our government announced that we are improving the medical review process to help Ontario disability support recipients. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us more about the most recent changes to the medical reviews process and how it benefits the ODSP recipients across this province? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for her question. Speaker, previously the ODSP medical review process used the same form that was required for a person's initial ODSP eligibility assessment. It was an unnecessarily stressful and administratively burdensome process for both ODSP recipients and service providers. Speaker, this new medical review process is easier for both ODSP recipients and health professionals, saving time and effort. Now, if the ODSP's recipients' medical condition has not improved and is not expected to improve, they will not have to undergo another medical review. They will just need to continue to meet all other eligibility requirements. And the healthcare professional will only be asked to provide further information in cases where improvement is reported or prognosis is unknown. With the new process in place, ODSP recipients won't have to repeat yes, their disability if they haven't seen any improvement in their health. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you as well to the Minister, not only for her answer, but also for being a steadfast and fierce advocate for those Ontarians that need it the most. Speaker, as you know, many vulnerable Ontarians are served by the programs and supports that are administered by the Ministry of Community and Social Services. I have heard from some social assistance recipients in my riding of Kingston and the Islands that some programs and supports are unfair, outdated, and unfriendly for recipients. This is unacceptable. However, I want to tell this House that thanks to the work of this minister and this government, there has been demonstrable progress to improve the experience of ind individuals in receipt of Ontario Works and ODSP, and this includes changes to the medical reviews process. Question. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please inform this House of some of the other recent improvements that have been made to social assistance? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And earlier this year, we ended the clawback of child support for recipients of social assistance and prevented any clawback of the Canada Child Benefit. We simplified the application process for young people with developmental disabilities applying for ODSP. We also introduced a reloadable payment card for ODSP recipients, increased the mileage rates for medical and business travel, and made changes to allow individuals to use their health card to access the Ontario drug benefit and we have established an income security working group that will create a roadmap to assist in modernizing the income security system speaker these are just a few examples of how we are driving real change for Ontarians as we continue to transform the way we deliver the services people Answer. need thank you mr speaker thank you new question the member from Bruce Gray on south thank you very much mr speaker my question is to the education minister after meeting the minister in person earlier this month, the plea for a stop to mass school closures and consolidation sweeping rural Ontario, Judy Keeling and Susan McKenzie of the Ontario Alliance Against School Closures said that the minister left them, and I quote, frustrated and disappointed. They said, quote, it was clear from the outset they would not be able to change your opinion or attitude. Wow. What I want to know, minister, is, the, is that the minister just announced liberal consultation tour of the communities hit with closures a real deal, or is that all an exercise, much ado about nothing? Much ado about nothing. Thank you. Minister of Education. So, Mr. Speaker, um, first of all, I want to say that um, the the parents that were here yesterday and uh, and those that had come forward to talk about um, schools, absolutely, Good Mr. People. Speaker. I went out. I I talked to uh, to many of them, Mr. Speaker, and I know that uh, that. 
parents and, uh, and students are concerned when, when there's a conversation happening around uh, the future of their school. Absolutely. And that's why we have a process in place to ensure that we listen to those concerns, Mr. Speaker. And even when a board has to make a very difficult decision, that that decision is done with the transition that's appropriate for all students so that our priority of ensuring our students very have the sensible. best education possible is maintained. On the engagements, Mr. Speaker, yeah. we're going out into communities in rural and northern Ontario right so that we can province. invite those discussions and, and listen, because there might be Answer. innovative and creative solutions, Mr. Speaker, that perhaps we need. We haven't thought of those, and we exactly. need to hear those, those conversations, Mr. Speaker, Thank and you. that's why we're engaging with communities. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the education minute. You would have thought you'd have had those discussions and listening before you actually started closing schools. It's a little late now, unless you're going to actually bring action to the table. You seem to be a walking, talking contradiction, but I'll try again. You said in yesterday's question period that your listening tour of rural communities is about hearing their ideas to save local schools. You said, and I quote, it's very important that we do listen to ensure we hear the ideas that parents and school communities want to tell us about their local schools. My question then is, if they tell you to put a moratorium in school closures, will you listen? Will you hear them this time? Yes or no? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, it's uh, it, what's important. You know, in in actually the members' own area, we had a really great conversation awesome. with the, the school board, with the municipality, uh, with the concerned members of the community that were talking about the future of that particular school. Mr. Speaker, that school is not closing. Instead, there's a conversation about how do we make it stronger? Yeah. How do we support the school community, the other with the community hub with perhaps a, a library or cultural services or or adult education? Mr. Very Speaker, good. there are ideas and there are initiatives that are happening in our local, rural, and remote communities, and we need to give the space for that conversation to occur. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite will join the Markdale conversation that's happening on May 25th. Um, you know, so that he can provide some of these great ideas Answer. and that we can move forward to ensuring that our schools are the best place possible for every student in Ontario. Here, Mr. Here. Speaker. No question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we are entering the eighth week with no resolution in sight that deaf and hard of hearing people in Waterloo Region have gone without Canadian Hearing Society services. Community members in Waterloo Region have been left with no choice but to bring their untrained family or friends along with them to doctor's appointments or to pick up prescriptions. Speaker, this compromises their confidentiality and their dignity. Family and friends are not professional interpreters. For deaf, or hearing, for deaf or hearing impaired people across this province, it is vital to have interpretation supports from within the deaf community, from people who know their language. Premier, what is this government doing to ensure that the deaf community has access to interpretation services during the strike, just like your own act ensures that they should have? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much, and thank you to the member for the question. And certainly, I think all members of this House share the concern about what is happening in this dispute and the people that are affected by that. So, so let me thank the member for raising the issue. And I think the support that's been shown from all three parties to the hearing society, to the people that are involved that need these services, is something we need to, uh, to focus on, Speaker. We need to get the parties back to the table, Speaker. It, it, it's, it's that simple, Speaker, is that we're able to do that in the vast majority of cases in the province of Ontario, almost 99% of cases in this province. I say this over and over again, Speaker, because it's something we should be proud of. In this case, it's a problematic situation, Speaker, to say the least. We need the parties to return to the table. We need to use whatever influence we have to ensure that happens, Speaker. As a Minister of Labour, obviously I need to stay as neutral Answer. in this regard Correct. and ensure that those parties come back Get and together. respect the, collecting, the collective bargaining process, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the employer has refused arbitration. These workers have been out for four years without a contract, without a raise, and the CEO, though, makes more than the Premier of this province. Hey. It is a shameful situation. The Canadian Hearing Society claims it's business as usual. 
during this strike. But according to the president of the Ontario Association for the Deaf, that is simply not true. And I quote, he said, members of the community are unable to access the services they need. The government just has to ask us. This is far from business as usual. A man from Kitchener-Waterloo told my office that he was forced to take time off work to act as an interpreter for his dying father in hospital. He wasn't allowed to be a grieving son because he needed to ensure his father's medical needs were communicated with doctors and other health care staff. This is his story, and I'm bringing it to this government. Your government, the major funder of the Canadian Hearing Society, Question. what is this government doing to assure members of the deaf and hard of hearing community that hearing services will be restored? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Can't participate. Minister. Speaker, the uh, minister responsible for accessibility. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I, too, would like to see this situation resolved as a minister responsible for accessibility, continuation of support and services for all persons with disabilities in Ontario is very important to me, so we do hope the matter is resolved as quickly as possible. And uh, Ministry officials have been advised by the agency that a contingency plan is in place to ensure continuity of services by those served by the agency. There are a number of services that are continuing. I hope I didn't hear what I thought I might have heard, and if it didn't, I'm glad. Thank you, Speaker. Video uh, remote interpreting services are continuing, on-demand 24 service emergency interpreting services at Ontario hospitals through the Ontario Telemedic Network, and employment services via Skype, and counselling services for clients who ur with urgent needs, walk-in uh, clinic support, and so on. So those are continuing, yes, but I hope this issue is resolved. Yeah. Thank you. Your question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for Poverty Reduction Strategy. Last Friday, I had the opportunity to meet with Fatine Chowdhury, David Cummings, and Amy Wayner. Fatine is living at home and commuting almost two hours each way, Mr. Speaker, because he can't afford to live in Toronto's expensive rental market. I also had the opportunity to meet with Amy from Davenport, a young single mom who is afraid, afraid she might receive an unreasonable rent hike and be forced to find a new home. Stories like Fatine's and Amy's are why I'm proud our government is expanding rent control for all private rental units, ensuring tenants are protected against sudden dramatic rent increases. Going forward, every renter in Ontario will have peace of mind knowing their rent is not going to increase beyond roughly the rate of inflation. Question. Could the minister please explain what this plan will mean for Ontario's renters? Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Davenport for the question and for her continued advocacy on, uh, on the, the part of her constituents. Speaker, with the uh, Rental Fairness Act, Ontario is answering the call to expand rental control, including those built or occupied after 1991. By passing this bill, approximately a quarter of a million more people will be protected from unreasonable rent hikes. Speaker, We've consulted with people on every side of the issue regarding the closing of the 1991 exemption, including landlords and tenants, economists, federal and municipal partners, and advocacy groups. I've heard from advocacy groups like Generation Squeeze, who sent my office a petition with over 3,000 signatures asking the government to expand rent control. Mr. Speaker, we have listened and we have brought forward a comprehensive package that will help yes, bring predictability, affordability, and opportunity to Ontario's rental market. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Minister for his answer. I've had conversations right across my riding of Davenport with tenants and tenant advocacy groups over their concerns that some landlords abuse the landlord's own use provision to evict tenants. In one case, a couple of my riding who had been living in their apartment for five years were asked by their landlord to move out because the landlord's mother was moving in. 
However, two months after moving out, the couple found an ad for their old apartment. The rent? It was listed at almost twice what they had been paying for. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. This practice is completely unfair, and I want to make sure everyone in my riding of Davenport knows our government is taking action. So could the minister please explain to this House Question. what the government is doing to prevent the abuse of this provision? Well, thank you, Speaker. Once again, I'd like to thank the uh, member from Davenport for that important question and observation. Our Rental Fairness Act, Speaker, not only addresses rent control, but it's, it's a comprehensive suite of reforms that will address issues across the rental housing system. Speaker, as part of the Rental Fairness Act, we're, we've taken, uh, we're taking steps to lessen the abuse of a provision in the Residential Tenancy Act known as Landlords Own Use. Under the proposed Rental Fairness Act, we would require landlords to provide written intention that they or their family will live in the unit for at least one year. Landlords would either need to compensate the tenant for one month's rent or offer the tenant another acceptable rental unit. Speaker, these changes will make it harder for landlords to abuse the, this provision while improving yes, security of tenure for tenants and lessening their financial hardship when they have to move. Thank you. New question, the member from Holloman, Norfolk. Yes, to the Minister of Health, uh, as we know, ticks, uh, mosquitoes are emerging across Ontario, as are the diseases they potentially carry. And as people now venture out uh, fishing, hunting, hiking, farming, they need to be informed. We now have legislation mandating a provincial framework, an action plan on vector-borne diseases like uh, West Nile, like Lyme. Minister, do we now have up-to-date surveillance data? Do we have up-to-date information for people as mandated by law, education programs and brochures to prevent exposure to Lyme and other emerging infectious diseases? It's now been two years. We have the legislation. Can the Minister of Health tell people affected or potentially affected uh, action government's taking on this law? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as a result of uh, the creation through my ministry of a Lyme disease uh, stakeholder group that com was comprised of uh, experts, uh, public health officials, frontline workers, uh, many, importantly, advocates for and individuals themselves who have experienced Lyme <laughs> disease, uh, uh, either of the acute or the chronic nature, Mr. Speaker. We, as a first step towards developing that comprehensive plan, last summer we issued an education and awareness framework and materials associated with that to alert people to the situation across the province. And of course, surveillance and data ga gathering is an important aspect of that. Now that that initial work is com being complete, we continue the work, including with our stakeholders, to look at other important aspects and of Lyme, dis Lyme disease. And I'm happy to uh, speak to that in the supplement. Supplementary. Supplementary. Yeah, thank you, uh, Speaker. And beyond that, uh, that work, we know the Lyme vector-borne uh, disease legislation also mandates research, diagnosis, treatment, management of diseases. Again, like Lyme, mandates the uh, the sharing of best practices. Earlier this year, the federal government changed the Lyme disease uh, case definition. Uh, for positive diagnosis of the disease, and I understand Ontario has uh, accepted, has adopted that federal definition. I get emails. People are now concerned the revised uh, definition may make things worse. Uh, they ask, will it eliminate uh, many chances of a timely diagnosis for many Lyme victims? Uh, will the minister explain to this House most importantly to people writing in, people feel they may be affected, how the changes to the, uh, the Government of Canada definition, now the Ontario definition, how will this impact people who may be suffering from uh, this disease? 
Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is correct that this is uh, such an important uh, um, issue. Uh, the the increasing prevalence incidence of Lyme disease that we're seeing we we you know we're from the same part I grew up uh, same part of the province I grew up in in Simcoe I spent my 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 family took the five my parents took our five kids down to Turkey Point uh, for a week each summer and that's one of the areas which is highly prevalent in Lyme disease but we're seeing it spread across this province including in the north and so he's right that now that we've focused on that important first aspect of education and awareness and data gathering. We're moving on to issues of diagnosis and treatment. Uh, an important aspect of it as well is to, uh, to provide the resources and the support to our frontline health care providers, particularly at the primary care level, where, they're, quite frankly, there's still uh, a resistance Spencer. among many uh, health care providers about the, uh, the reality of Lyme disease and the, ne the necessity of treating it properly. We're working with our federal Thank counterparts, you. everybody, to make sure we get this right. New question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you. And my question is to the Premier. Speaker, this Liberal government has an agreement with the federal government to warehouse federal immigration detainees in our provincial maximum security jails. These detainees, not inmates, detainees, are often incarcerated because of issues with paperwork, and instead of being held in federal immigration holding centres, many are hidden away, locked up in jail without due process. I visited the detainees on a hunger strike last summer, and they are still waiting for answers and waiting for the government to do the right thing. To add insult to injury, this provincial government makes money on this deal. They get paid a 20 per cent bonus above and beyond the cost of care, and I wonder where that money goes. Speaker, why is this government in the business of immigration detention? Thank you. Security Security safety, correctional services. The Security Safety Correctional Services. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her uh, question. Um, I think it's important to note that these are federal detainees that we are supporting in our provincial uh, institutions. Having said that, they are entitled to every aspect uh, of services and care that we provide. Um, the, the Premier gave me a clear mandate, actually, as a Minister of Correctional uh, Services, which is actually to look at the, to transform our Ontario correctional system. And I'm happy, actually, to share uh, some of the um, aspect of where we are working right now. And it's definitely what I would say a top priority for us. Um, you know, when we think about area where we need to focus, it's improving staff yes, and inmate safety, uh, rehabilitation and reintegration. So I'll go back into those questions in our supplementary. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier, and a reminder that they're not inmates, they're detainees. At the start of April, I sent a letter to the Premier outlining all of the concerns around this issue, and I'm still waiting for a response. The province can't just lock away federal problems. People in crisis deserve a fair process. People with mental health needs deserve attention. Complicated immigration cases deserve to be handled. They do not deserve to be swept under the provincial rug and left to languish. The province of Ontario should not be in the business of immigration detention. Will the Premier agree to stop hiding federal problems? behind our provincial walls and stop warehousing federal immigration detainees. Thank you. Minister. So, I would like to go back on on aspect of things that we are doing for all our detainee and our inmates. I want to also take the opportunity to thank our correctional officers and all our staff in our correctional system that does an amazing job every single day, Mr. Speaker. This fall, we've announced a series of initiatives to improve access to health care services, improve conditions of confinement, and support rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, and I want to share this today because as the member mentioned, this is a federal aspect, but I want to share with you, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing here in Ontario to help and support an investment of $33 million annually to address immediate priorities in the system, including $14.8 million for initial capital improvements. We're also doing investment to support our long-term goals of improving overall conditions of improvement, such a better access to program and service, improved social interaction, and more time out of sales. Thank you. Thank you. New question. 
with the member from Ottawa Vanier. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the health minister. It is important for patients to have access to health care services. And is great investment in our system, in the hospitals, in our community sector, in mental health, and in long-term care. I also understand and I believe that it's important to leverage the expertise of all of the care professionals that we have in order that we can work toward faster access to health care, better home and community care, and a health care system that is sustainable for generations to come. I also understand that last week our government made an important announcement with, that will improve patient access to care. So my question to the minister is, can he inform this House on how our government is making, is working toward improving health care and support nurse practitioners in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I really appreciate this question. Uh, as we all know, nurse practitioners play such an important and critical role in our health care system, including in, but not limited to, our 25 nurse practitioner-led clinics. And so, Mr. Speaker, our government is helping people across the province to get even better access to safe and high-quality health care closer to home by providing nurse practitioners with the authority to prescribe controlled drugs and substances. And providing them with this ability to prescribe controlled drugs and substance, it's uh, not only a way to provide better access to care, but it's well within their current abilities and scope, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. So it's the right thing to do. And it, it com combined with the Answer. efforts that we made last year on recruitment and retention and increasing the compensation for our nurse practitioners, this is a really important Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. This opportunity to thank him, for, uh, thank him for his clear and unwavering leadership in modernizing our health care system and, uh, and supporting the nursing profession. Nurses play an important role in our health care system, and I know that they have an incredibly positive impact on all patients. Over 28,000 nurses have been hired since 2003, and I also hear that uh, last week both the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario and the Nurse Practitioners Association of Ontario were very pleased about the announcement and with this new designation for nurses practitioner. I also understand that the Nurse Practitioner Association is encouraged by this announcement that will enable, enable all nurse practitioners. Uh, to prescribe controlled drugs. Can the Minister of Health please inform this House on how these changes will affect patients? Well, Mr. Speaker, this uh, new prescribing authority will uh, help Ontario's nurse practitioners help even more patients, and particularly in those parts of the province where they may be the only health care practitioner. And so access to controlled drugs and substances is particularly important. So, providing this new prescribing authority for nurse practitioners. We're helping patients get better and faster access to, for example, care for conditions that might require controlled drugs and substances, including individuals with pain, with anxiety, with sleep disorders, those in palliative care, Mr. Speaker, and those uh, with substance abuse disorder, including opioid disorders. Uh, and as I mentioned, particularly in rural and remote and northern communities where other providers may not be yes, available sir. right away. So this is treatment closer to home. It respects the role of nurse practitioners, and I'm very pleased that we've made this change, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. New question the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. Speaker, his Liberal government has spent the last 13 years years doing nothing but increasing the cost of doing business in Ontario and driving companies and jobs south of the border. We are hearing that stakeholders are concerned and want to know why his ministry hasn't truly mobilized to manage and assist Ontario businesses to prepare for the recent executive orders we've heard about this week. What we want to know, Speaker, is why is he being bullied into a position of being reactive instead of being proactive? Thank you. 
Minister of International Trade. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, for the uh, question. Uh, Speaker, international trade plays a key role in Ontario's economy, increasing our export to critical markets that will strengthen job growth and the province's economic prosperity. Facts still matter in Ontario, Speaker. This is why it is important to note that every 100 million in export creates 1,000 jobs and generates 83 million for Ontario GDP. Speaker, Ontario's real GDP increased by 0.7 per cent in the third quarter of 2016, and high exports were cited as being the primary driver in these gains. Speaker, our ability to create, develop and maintain partnership around the globe is critical for our future Answer. economic prosperity. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, no matter how they spin it, people are still moving. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. No matter how they spin it, people are still moving south of the border. And back to the minister. Right now, under their watch, we are seeing. As I've said many times, it's never too late to get a warning or be named. Good question, please. Speaker, I would love to see them face our greenhouse that moved to Nebraska. Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Under his watch, we are seeing Ontario getting pushed around. How can we trust them to defend Ontario's interests when their government has proven its inability to keep companies like Suntastic Tomatoes, who's moved to Nebraska, to keep other companies like that greenhouse and good-paying jobs right here in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. Speaker, since I was appointed being the international minister, I've been very busy. I've been very busy down America. Speaker, I have been in Tennessee, Albany, New York, Chicago, New York City, of course. On top of that, Speaker, I was very busy in globalization by outreaching to the rest of the world. Speaker, I was in Germany, in UK, in China, in India, in Mexico. Speaker, I understand that. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Speaker, Ontario outreach to the world is very important. At the same time, we must deepen our trading relationship with America. That's why our Premier is so busy visiting America, engaging the governors yeah, yeah. and engaging the, yeah, yeah. the state. Thank you so very much. Sure. Thank you. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. The ice is off beautiful Mackinac River, and there's oil everywhere. You'll remember that CN dumped 1.4 million litres of crude oil when it derailed in Gogama. Last year, it took seven months, 10,000 petitions, a blockade on opening of Moose Han, a press conference, uh, numerous interventions in this House, a visit from David Suzuki, and seven months later, the cleanup started again. I want to ask the minister, how long will it take this year before you order CN to come back to Gogama and clean up their mess? Here, here. Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I, I want to uh, let the member know that I share her concern, and I do appreciate her advocacy, and I think that we have worked very well and very constructively on this. And I know we may have some disagreement because the amount of research and assessment, it only takes uh, a seconds for an oil spill to happen to actually sort out how the oil, where it's going, how to retrieve it, and how to mitigate it without doing more harm 
take some time. Once that assessment was done, action was taken right away, and I think you and I at that time were satisfied that action was taken. I said last year that the important moment was going to be when the ice came up that we would have a much better idea of the lingering legacy of that project, and I said last time that I would immediately take action with CN and, sir, if we had oil problems, and I will maintain that commitment, Mr. Speaker. Mr. On a point, of order. point of order, Speaker, I want to introduce to you and through you to members of the Legislative Assembly, constituents, young women from my riding of Leeds Grenville, who are here for my girls' government, and representatives from Girls Inc. of Upper Canada. Welcome to Queen's Park. <laughs> Mr. of Labour, point of order. We all rely so heavily on our staff here. I've got the best legislative assistant anybody, any member could hope to have. For some, real, for some odd reason, Speaker, she's decided she wants to be a lawyer. Today is her last day. I'd just like to say goodbye to her and thank her. Thank you. Member from Davenport, Point of Order. Yes, thank you, Speaker. On a point of order, I would just like to wish uh, my former seatmate here, the member from Brampton Springdale, a very happy birthday today. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Hallam and Norfolk has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning Lyme disease. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Huron-Bruce has given notice of her dissatisfaction to the answer to her question given by the Minister of International Trade concerning trade with the United States. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.